on the journey of our lives, we're always presented with choices. And if we're open to this life and say yes to what comes our way, we have a chance to maybe see that small, quiet road that might be filled with heart and joy for us instead of whisking right past it, never even knowing that it, with all its possibilities, was even there. How did a man who was on the team that built the original CNN.com end up in a salt cave in New Hampshire? Let's find out. This is Prosperity and Something Greater. My guest today is Daryl Brown. I've known Daryl since the late 1990s when we worked together at Classroom Connect, which was a company focused on using technology in K-12 instruction. This in the 90s when people were just learning about the internet and were using dial-up modems. Daryl and I have always been kindred spirits and have enjoyed a personal friendship that had nothing to do with technology or instruction, but much more to do with the journey of life that we're all on. You're going to hear his very interesting story about how he and his wife built Soleil's Salt Cave in Exeter, New Hampshire in 2017 to ease their newborn daughter Soleil's health journey. With a web development career spanning 25 years, seven continents, and several Fortune 500 companies, Daryl's always endeavored to apply his technology experience to giving people the most efficient and effective path from start to finish possible. I can attest to that. And also, for nearly the same amount of time, Daryl's been fostering his vision of creating a body of work that would help people focus on the power of each moment of their own lives. That project has led to bottled messages, literally bottled in ball mason jars. He calls journey jars, mixed media art installations, and several books, which we will talk about. And now, my dear friend, Daryl Brown. Well, welcome to the podcast, everybody. Hi, this is Rem, and with me is my dear friend. And I have a lot of good friends. I have a few dear friends, but I have a dear friend of mine and a fellow traveler on the journey of life, uh, my friend Daryl Brown. Daryl, thank you for taking the time, coming out of the salt cave and spending some time with us today to talk about this really fun topic of prosperity. Welcome, my friend. Thanks so much, Rem. It's so good to talk to you as well. Yeah, I have been looking forward to this. And so let me ask you the very first question of the questions I like to ask folks, and that is, how would you define prosperity for you? So I have a number of years, maybe not as many as you, but I've got, I feel like I really have, you know, earned the answer. It is the pursuit. So it's, I've had a few wins. And as you reflect on the wins, like, wow, the win was nice, but it was really about the journey you tend to really cherish the lessons from the losses. And I actually had a friend who was a um, a rocket scientist. People talk about, you know, it's not rocket science, but this guy was a rocket scientist. And he said his mentor told him he's forgotten all the problems and he's forgotten all the solutions, but he always remembered the principles that got him there. I always took that to heart. And it's born true that um, how you went about the journey is all that you bring with you. So again, prosperity to me would be um, the ability to pick a goal and pursue it, not attain it, but you know, just the, the pursuit prosperous. If you can pick one, pursue and just notice along the way. And enjoy the whole process along with the ups that come, the downs that come, the sideways that come, the mundane, sometimes part of some of it. Just enjoy that journey. Yeah, that, that's it. I had a 25 year technology career that netted X amount of money. And then about four years ago, I had a daughter with eczema. And so we created this salt cave to help her, just to help her, plan to do it in the house. And the people who build them said, no, you can't do it in your house. You have to have a business. And so we set up this place just so we could do it in whatever way it needed to be done. And within 18 months, a little bit less, that eclipsed any money I'd ever made over the 25 years of intentional so of this grinding and, okay, I've got to get here. It's just, oh, by virtue of doing heart work, heart-centered work, that other piece of the, the brass rings was just attained. So it was just another, one of the daily lessons I literally turn the key and walk into of it's not about 
so much effort as it is about really feeling into why are you doing what you're doing? And when you have the why, things just somehow line up, you know? They really do. They really do. And you cannot force it. And I think that's what causes so much stress and so much struggle with folk. You've heard how I sign off on my podcast. It's really my philosophy now. And it is really my ultimate goal every day is to have my best day ever, no matter what, no matter what. And I get it more often than I, than I miss it, though times I'll miss it, but it's not often. Yeah, I agree. It's about that. It doesn't matter what the events or circumstances are in the day, just the act of noticing, we can call it intention setting, whatever, but just that act of gathering in all the data so you can be grateful, you end up with a mighty day for sure. Yeah. So let, let's give everybody a chance to meet you a little bit. What would you say was the defining moment or event? I mean, you've talked a little bit about where you're at now, but really your career journey. I mean, folks, I, I mentioned this a little bit in the beginning, but I met you when uh, we were both at Classroom Connect and we were working on our big project called Connected University. And we were trying to figure out, Daryl, you remember this. I mean, there was almost no online learning. I remember there was something called Ziff Davis University which we looked at and said, wow, check that out. But we were borderline inventing this as we went along. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, early days. <laughs> this was the one of the premier e-learning, especially for specifically for teachers as a portal just for them. This was this was it. Yeah. And we needed a magician. We had wise people. We had Dr. John Gould, Dr. Terry Gray advising us on how to set this up. And they had done all this work and whatever. But we needed a technology magician to do something called get it on the internet and make it work. And and really, you know, this brilliant fellow who had actually done a lot of pioneering work on this with CNN, you know, which a lot of people, you know, don't really know that there's a time CNN maybe didn't have a web page uh, and he shows up and and we built this together and uh, that's how we met. So, you know, but tell us a little bit about Daryl, if you don't mind, you know, how'd you get everywhere? And it's, it's all a funny story that all ends up with the same tagline or the same punchline of just saying yes. So I grew up in New Hampshire, full circle, I'm back in New Hampshire, so that's a spoiler. But I grew up in New Hampshire, went to um, Harvard University for biological anthropology. My family sent me to be a doctor and I was sure I was going to not do that and maybe trick them with a major that sounded like medical, so it was biological, and then I'd mumble the anthropology part. So I was just fascinated with all the medicine men and all the uh, alternative healing things. So I got into um, focusing on medicine men in Tanzania, psychosomatic health and wellness, I think it was, but just these fascinating Western world accounts of unexplainable things that happened based on what people believed. And so I wanted to be a, an academic but based on my the whole saying yes thing, I was just enamored of all the libraries at Harvard. So I would read everything possible, Tao Te Ching, all the things that aren't, didn't relate to anything that needed to be done for a test. My advisors were not big fans. Uh, and then 1993 was a um, low economy, high war time, I think. So I, I signed up for the Marines and did that and uh, broke my ankle and then said yes to an early out. And then uh, ended up at Houghton Mifflin doing some publishing support work and just really had a dream to be a writer. So my intention was to, to be a writer, but didn't quite know how to get there. And I was really intent on doing something genuine, authentic that was mine. But, you know, you're young, so CNN was a, a thing at the time. So I took writing tests, got in, was so happy. I was excited. I'm, I had found it. I was, you know, a couple jobs out and I had my dream. I am a writer. I get paid to write news stories. But then in short order, it was clear I wasn't going to get promoted because I wasn't a, um, I was not a trained uh, journalist. So I kind of, I worked everywhere. I worked at CNN Spanish, CNN International, CNN um, Proper Headline News. So I just basically tried to compensate by being everywhere at once. And I was trying to be noticed by uh, CNN International, I think. So I flew myself to China for the Tiananmen anniversary. Uh, it was a big news story. It was, I think Ted Koppel's daughter was the... Um, person, the bureau chief. And there was just a you know general, every company has a culture, but journalism has its culture. And I, you know, was, I was an outsider. So I thought this will be my big break. I'll break in. I'll fly myself there, learn some Chinese over at Emory University. So while I was there or going, China has their own um, 
rules about who comes and goes. And I was too young and dumb to know that. So I got there and was basically just put on the bench because the Chinese authorities hadn't approved this strange person just flying. And so I spent a, a couple of weeks in uh, Beijing just tooling around. But meanwhile, back at CNN, CNN.com was just starting up. And among the places I had volunteered and sort of been my little bee pollinating all the flowers, I had done some volunteer work at CNN.com. And they said, well, where's that Daryl guy? And somebody said, well, he's in China right now. And so I wasn't actually there under any great qualifications, but by saying uh, yes to everything, including my own hunches, when I returned, I had the job at CNN.com. So I was one of the first couple of uh, associate producers for CNN.com, figuring out how do you create content? What is this online thing? So uh, claim to fame, I am the first, I put the first GIF in a news story. So it was a Squash Me Elmo story that the asset has since been taken down, but the story is still available in like a time machine site somewhere. But uh, yeah, I, I did the first animated GIF to uh, accompany a news story. I said yes to CNN.com, right place, right time. The, the web was rising. And then I just continued to say yes. No one knew what you needed to do to get this stuff done programming wise. I just happened to have grown up in a household of my father was an engineer, so he used to just bring uh, microprocessors home to mess with. But I swore as a young man, I'll never do that. And I'm, I'm going to be this writer, but it was in my blood. I had been raised around technology, never took a computer science course, which was good because those who took computer science courses in 1990s, they knew what to say no to. And, you know, these strange new things would be what to say no to. I knew no better and just said yes. So I rode the wave straight into uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Manhattan Beach, and that's where our paths crossed. I remember you um, You said, you know, what do you need? And uh, I said, I don't know, but books are a good place to start. And I remember it was in Pennsylvania where uh, I think you took me to the bookstore, gave me a fresh credit card, and I remember walking out there with arm's length, maybe two arm's length of books, and just, you know, we set up the team, technology stack, and... Didn't know what we were doing, but knew enough to keep saying yes. So that's been the story. There's, there's every pivot point in my career and life. It has been saying yes, despite what details appear. Yeah, and we can, we can keep going with that. <laughs> and then your journey led you back to, and you've already told the story of why you now own and operate a Salt Cave. I'm now, since you and I've discussed this, I learned there's one very near me in Las Vegas. Diane and I are going to head down and um, experience it. So we know why you started it. Just for curiosity's sake, I think for folks, or maybe someone here listening thinks, you know, what the health benefits. So, you know, what's the deal with going to someone, a place that has a salt cave or room? Yeah. So great question. My wife and I were on vacation in Santa Barbara and she happens to be from Ukraine. And so she looked across the street and said, oh, look, a salt cave, just like back home. And I thought, what are you talking about? So I went in just as a tourist gimmick type thing of, oh, let's see. I wasn't you know, sick or anything, didn't have any specific need, but I went in, we did a session, sat in a chair, the room filled with a mild mist of uh, pharmaceutical salt. And I came out thinking, what in the world just happened? I feel great, but uh, I feel different. I just felt more relaxed than I'd been in forever. Again, not going in looking for it, but just finding it by accident. I thought, that's wild. So I just kept researching it afterwards. We bought a house in New Hampshire a couple of years later, and the house was just a beautiful, this woodland house with a clear basement, maybe 2,000 square feet of just empty basement. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if you could put one of those in here. So just as a man cave idea, I was just sort of bouncing it around, looking at who builds salt caves? How do you do that? Just a, just a side mental mind break activity. And then we had a baby a year later with a really severe eczema where she would, her scalp was bloody and raw. And so we'd co-sleep and hold her wrist to keep from, keep her from scratching. And from the frustration of that, her chest would raise up with welt. It was just a really awful time of, holy cow, we went to specialists uh, for relief and everything seemed to cause more agitation, deeper rashes and things. And she was like a cricket. Her legs were just constantly rubbing her legs against each other. And so I just thought, man, could this bring some relief? So in the research, I looked at, it's uh, the whole thing is from the 1800s where Poland had a, a native salt mine in Wilichka near Krakow. There was a plague that went through the town and the villagers got sick and died. Coal miners 
who also were in the town, they obviously they died no matter what. They got black lung and died. But the salt miners would go to work, come home, and they were unaffected during the whole thing. So a physician came in and, and studied the whole thing, and he had his control group. Okay, the coal miners are dying no matter what. The villagers get sick and die when they have this plague that's going through. But the salt miners are fine, and also the horses that were working in the salt mines were living six years longer than other horses. So they started sending people into the salt mines for all kinds of things. Like, yeah, so the, the experiments ranged, but... Then uh, it just became a health regimen, and they weren't sure, is it the depth or the salt that's doing it? So the so fast forward, uh, the Germans also discovered the same thing in World War II, where they would evacuate patients into the salt caves for safety. Anybody with tuberculosis would come out cured. So they thought, okay, there's something here. The Soviets differentiated, so they made barometric pressure rooms where you could have the depth thing, and then salt rooms. And the salt rooms had an undeniable effect on breathing issues, on skin issues, had joint pain, all kinds of stuff. So the Soviets are who created these above ground salt environments. So in Eastern Europe, it's much more common for hospitals to just have them in them. So my wife grew up near Chernobyl. And during that time, they would just send the kids to the hospital for different treatments. Salt rooms are just part of the treatment. Oh, go in the hospital, have your liver looked at, and then go spend an hour in the salt room. So again, I was just doing it to have Soleil, our daughter, get some relief. She could just rest for a while. And uh, within two weeks of this, the whole thing cleared up. Like Her scalp looked totally normal. So I thought, you know, being a technology person, I'm like, okay, this is not logical that this would just happen like this. So the doctors had said, maybe she'll grow out of it. So I thought maybe she grew out of it. So we stopped bringing her. And in two weeks, it came back to the same degree. So I thought, okay, I don't fully know what I don't know. So we brought her again for two weeks, about 15 minutes a day. Yeah, you would never know. Her scalp is as clear and clean as mine. Well, she's got hair, but... So we've been open four years with this salt cave, and we've seen everything from you know Lyme disease, arthritis, COPD, style, like everything. It's been fibromyalgia. People come with all kinds of things, and they leave. I could just I could go on and on with the stories that I've seen firsthand, so... There's no straight line from being a troublemaking student at Harvard Public Health Department to um, Salt Cave. I guess it goes through REM. So you're the you're the one, you're the X factor. So as long as you're no. called REM, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, so just saying saying yes ended up in a place that, and now it's a community hub. People come from four hours north, four hours south to do this. Every day, again, every day I turn the key and come in here. It's thousands of people, thousands and thousands have come so far. Just like this, this was no plan. And we did it for our daughter. Our daughter's name is Soleil. It's a salt cave. It's called Soleil Salt Cave. The guiding principle is right up on the sign out there. So it's very tight loop on what we're doing and why we're doing it. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. I just love that. I Truly love that. By the way, we will put a link in the podcast to the website for your salt cave because folks up there might want to visit it. The town is, um, is it Exeter? Is that the town? Exeter, yeah. Yeah, New Hampshire. It was actually the capital of the country during the revolution. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Capital moved around a lot. Uh, Lancaster was a U.S. So. capital for right, a while. Been a few. York, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Oh, Lancaster was too? Yeah, um. yeah. Yeah, they had to they had to hide over there. So um, uh, I think I think a little bit. So yeah, but York for sure was longer. York, PA, yeah. where, where we were. Okay, well, Daryl. So let me ask you this: We all have challenges along the way, things that can give us trouble. What are the things that really trip you up on your journey? So that's an easy one. If I just go from so the saying yes is a blessing and a curse. You've got to be sure you know what you're saying yes to. So just to start from the salt cave. At the beginning, we said yes to everything. So we had practitioners coming, doing all kinds of events. We had um, we offered massage. So we had people wanting all this different spa treatment. And then we just had regular cave sessions. And so again, mind you, we've put, it's an incredible investment. It's about $250,000 outlay to do the thing. And then all these things are on top of that, having practitioners with 1099, subcontractors, and the essence of it is, okay, I know what you've done, but I want more. And so saying yes to that is saying, oh, I understand. It goes without saying that I'm not enough. I'll do another thing, okay? And so we bent over backwards for a solid two years before I started feeling like, you know, this is not, and we're, you know, you're being assured by other businesses, hey, you got to play ball. You got to do what people want, give them what they want. And then, you know, 
down the road, you'll get what you want. And I thought, wow, again, this was never done as a quote unquote business guiding principles on the sign. It's Soleil's Salt Cave. The act of finishing it construction wise was the deliverable because the reporters came out and they asked, like, what are your expectations? And we were twiddling our toes in the salt, in the salt cave at the time. And I'm like, you're, you're in it. Like we're done. The expectations are met by finishing this. We bootstrapped the whole thing ourselves. So there was no, we've got to meet a certain mark to, it's like, no, this is for our family, but we're happy to share it with the world. And there's no expectation beyond let's get our daughter in here and do it in a way that it's basically an extension of our living room. But so then imagine, well, it's not hard to imagine. I think we all do it all the time where somebody says, great, I see what you're offering me. I see who you are. And it'd be great if you could add a couple of features to this. If only you dot, dot, dot. So we did that enough times that people outright told us like, I will come to the cave when you do certain things, but I wouldn't just come to this thing and sit there. And while on the surface, it's like, oh yeah, of course, nobody wants just a pizza with nothing on it. But it's like, again, because of the guiding principle, it's like we built this thing, sacrificed our entire you know, life savings for our daughter and someone, whether it's a contractor or a customer is telling you, oh yeah, that's just, yeah, that's not enough. I need more. So it took a while and COVID was a huge blessing of just getting straight to the point of it cleared the board on all that. It's like, let's start fresh. Does anybody not want to just sit anymore? And so we had a lot of people really get back to basics. And there's just a straight medical benefit that's one thing. But then that that universal thing, if people want to gather once things subsided, well, where do they, you want to gather somewhere safe? Well, here's somewhere safe. Well, you want to be with your trusted group somewhere where you can, if not break bread, just commune. So here's somewhere you can be together, commune, and leave healthier than you came. and all the other things have just faded into the background. So the challenge, ongoing challenge, is to make sure we're saying yes to our core competency, to our heart-driven mission, and not saying yes to someone's fancy. That is a really eloquent way of saying the one rule that I've learned to live by. And we started Top Practices 15 years ago, which is amazing to me. But do not chase the shiny bright objects because they're or they're attractive. You just like, ooh, that's a shiny bright object. And I've I've learned just, you know, I think Warren Buffett said, you know, successful people say no to most things. Highly successful people say no to almost everything. And so you just do wow. what you do. And there's a joy in that that comes from it. But the whole world's gonna tell you different. Like you said, everybody's got an opinion, right? At the end of the day, take it all in, learn from it. But then really, like you said, follow your heart. Well, Daryl, well, then what's a top strategy you use to keep heading, you know, in the right direction and trying not to slip back into these old habits, which are always waiting right around the bend? Yeah, so it's a great question. I try to focus on, because I've read books about habits and I really try to work on, on the inner game more than the outer game. And, uh, and I've just seen it play out where when I am, when I work on me, somehow the circumstances seem to change outside without receiving any prior warning. For me, it's just analyzing my own habits, like hyper analyzing my own habits. Like, what are you doing today? Why are you doing that? How long are you doing that? And then supplanting bad habits, just overriding them with good habits, but re- not focusing so much on the bad habits because um, just from studying so many people and having lived, lived across a couple of careers and seen so many different models of success, I find that focusing on the spilt milk just doesn't, that's an offering. Every, there's, there's, you get to do everything. You get to do anything you want in this life. You get to focus on your flaws. You get to address your flaws, delve deep into your flaws, or you get to build and keep building, building. And if the foundation is shaky, just move a couple inches over, start a new foundation. But to look at the, oh, this foundation is so bad. The concrete I poured is so bad. Can we just talk about how bad this concrete is? That will always be there. There'll be plenty of groups and people you can talk to who can talk to you and analyze your prior concrete choices. That is a way. I won't, I don't want to poo-poo it. That works for somebody. For me, it has been about what are you doing? Do we need to add another thing? And if that other thing is overridingly good, it just somehow drowns out the negative. Yeah. So the people that are listening to this podcast, they're, they're interested in really achieving their own version of prosperity. Any additional advice for them? And just to use my, just to speak from experience rather than theory, it's like you have no idea what you are cutting off when you say no. Just like you have no idea what you are 
potentially going to learn when you say yes. As much as I complained about, oh, I got sidetracked by saying yes to these things. I could have read a bunch of books that would have said, just do one thing. But saying yes will always lead you toward your path because you'll, you can either say no and no and no, and eventually your yeses will be pure yeses. Yeah, you just got to agree to, to tap into whatever is around you. There's not a bad or good judgment when you're just saying yes, because you're, you're basically saying, I'm going to appreciate this. And if this is a half full glass, well, I appreciate it in its half fullness. And parenthetically, I will be pursuing a full glass tomorrow. You know, you know I have a couple of rules in life that I live by. One of them is always take the meeting. Always take the meeting. In fact, yesterday I had a uh, young man, friend of mine had said, there's somebody that lives in Vegas that I think you ought to meet. No idea what the connection could be at all, but I just have a rule. Always take the meeting. So we sat out back in my backyard and, and had a discussion. This person's involved in the world of podiatry and some of the things that we're doing in a very different way. And I learned some really, really cool things I did not know, which I thought you know, if you'd have told me that that was possible, I would have totally had agreed, but also would have thought, well, I mean, I've really been around here for a while. And I picked up some very interesting stuff. And who knows? You know, I built top practices under the principle of the mastermind, which is Napoleon Hill's second principle of success. And I can attest to the unbelievable value of of working together with like-minded people. I, I know how important that is. And so one of the things when when we'll hold a mastermind meeting, one of the ways that you do this is some it's somebody's turn and they get to talk about what's going on and they get to have, you know, discuss if they're smart, they won't spend a lot of time telling you all the, you know, the great this and I did this. They, they will say, I'm having this issue and I'd like to ask the group, you know, what do you think about this? And then they just listen. And I've been trying to, you know, I really work with and it works pretty well, teach people no matter what anybody says, just listen, take it in. Another rule of mine is the answer is yes. Now, what's the question? Because later, after the meeting or after you've learned more, you can then say no and probably should to almost everything. But you'll never know if you don't have that openness. Yeah, that, that is the one caveat I put to the saying yes. It's commitment is separate from saying yes. So you say yes to the experience, say, bring the thing in. But then when it comes to commitment, keep that just so laser focused that it's basically, I've lear- I'm learning that part now where, wow. The majority of things, I stopped answering the phone a few months ago because I was having to say the same thing over and over again. And I need to train customers to come to us in a certain way so that I can provide the best uh, experience while they're here. And that was a great, same as locking the door. So the, the new COVID, post-COVID practice of locking the door helped to raise the bar of this may not be the place for you. you know? And if it is, that door opens wide up, right? Come on in. Here we go. Your experience is safe. And to a, similarly, the phone, it's I, as the purveyor of this experience and the, the keeper of the salt, I need to keep my time safe. And if these are questions that can be answered some other way, it's probably a no to me picking up the phone. Yeah, that was a big growing up step of, yeah, I know you want hand holding, but my hands are both tied up doing other stuff. Yeah. That will be for your greater good when you come, you know. Yeah, that is a lesson that I learned a long time ago. I now have layers upon layers before you can access my time because I'm focused on the people that I'm, you know, my what I call them in top practices, they're members. And uh, I work with them and I'm I'm working with them so to get to me, it's 100% doable always. And for my members it can be very quick, but it isn't straight to me. Almost never. Uh, that's not, not always. I mean, I have broken that rule, but I've also found out every time I break that rule, my team really gives me a hard time because I cause problems. So I really do behave myself. So Daryl, fun question that I've just enjoyed. I may write a book about the answers to these questions, but if you were a toy, any toy at all, what would you be and why? Any toy. So, okay. I'll ask a qualifying. Can that toy be in multiples or it's a single thing? Sure. No rules. I'll say dominoes. Dominoes, because I like to set up a structure and then, you know, see it play out. So I'll say a healthy box of dominoes. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> I, when you say that, I can just see them all. You know, I can see those patterns that people yeah. make. Up a ramp, down a ramp. Seen some amazing ones. You ever done anything like that? You ever put any of those together? Yes, you can imagine. I can. Yeah. 
It, uh, it was called Connected University. Touche. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so one question, last question is, is there any great book that you think you could recommend for anybody that we should maybe all get a look at? Absolutely. Although this book, I would highly recommend the audio book version just because it's so well done. And uh, you already mentioned the author. So it's Napoleon Hill's Outwitting the Devil. I have listened to that audio book at least 20 times over the past few years. You know, the content is great, but that rendition of it is like nothing else. I just keep going back to it. I love that book. You know, they didn't publish it for, I guess, like over 50 years, Yeah, at least 50 years after he had passed away. Man, it was about that. The reason being, they felt it was too controversial. Talking to the devil. <laughs> yeah, it, It's just fantastic. I look at, the other day, I took a look at what books do you go back to? And that book is always open, you know, again, the audio form, but it's always on. I find so much to it. That's a number one with very few contenders taking its spot. Year over year, it's got to be, you know, the past more than 10 years, at least 10 years where that's been my top top pick. It's brilliant. It's just brilliant. You know, I don't know. Have you read his book, Grow Rich with Peace of Mind? Have you read that? I have not. Well, here's an interesting tip. So first of all, I own every Napoleon Hill book, pamphlet, tape, CD, whatever you want to call it, that I've ever been able to get my hands on. However, Grow Rich with Peace of Mind is a book that I had and I'd never read because I just thought it was another kind of reworking of Napoleon Hill's philosophies by his foundation. Well, no, it wasn't. It was actually the last book he wrote, not that long before he passed away. It's really, really worth your time. So Grow Rich with Peace of Mind, Napoleon Hill. Um, it's Napoleon Hill at the very end. I highly recommend that you pick that book up and you read it because it's special. And if you liked Outwitting the Devil, you will like Grow Rich with Peace of Mind. I guarantee it. And Daryl, are your books available to purchase online? Yeah, they're on Amazon. Yeah. Okay. And anywhere else they can get them outside of Amazon? Oh, yes, there is in Exeter, New Hampshire, this interesting place called Soleil's Salt Cave. Right. Okay, good. So (laughs) they stop by. Yeah, I've got your books here. One's called The Journey of a Thousand Breaths, A Book of Reminders That You Are the Gift. And then the other one is entitled You Are the Gift, A Decade's Worth of Daily Reminders. These are fascinating, fascinating books. They're nothing but three-line thoughts. I mean, hundreds of maybe even thousands of simple, small ideas that are incredibly large and profound. And you can pick up these books, read one and think about that, meditate on that the rest of the day. I highly recommend Daryl's books. I was delighted to see that you took those years ago, folks. I mean, a long time ago now, Daryl came to see me and he had these written down on a little piece of paper. And I think I made some kind of a mention about it would be helpful to you to kind of package them in a certain way. And I might have given you the idea on how you did it. Do you remember that? I do. With journey jars that uh, all roads lead through REM, I think. That's funny. <laughs> Say yes and see REM. <laughs> well, he put them in ball mason jars and, and I've got mine sitting here, the one that you gifted me all those years ago. And now they're in a book. Folks, if you want something to just help you on your journey of a thousand breaths, pick up Daryl's books. The, the links will also be in the podcast. My dear friend, thank you for spending the time with me and for sharing your thoughts on what has become a delightful journey of my own, just talking to wise people that have something to share. The very first podcast, I was trying to figure this out. I was trying to describe it or whatever. And I look back on it now and I think, wow, Rem 30 plus episodes in would have really benefited from talking to Rem day one. So the journey has been worthwhile for me and I've enjoyed every second of it. So Daryl, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure to see you and talk to you. Traveling the world, inventing, creating simple three-line thoughts called reminders. Here's the preface to Daryl's book entitled A Journey of a Thousand Breaths, a book of reminders that you are the gift. I believe everything happens for a reason. I believe everywhere we go, we're needed. 
I believe everyone we meet will teach us. That, I believe, is prosperity and something even greater, much greater. Let me know what you think. You can send me an email at rem at toppractices.com. Prosperity is the entire focus of top practices. Most doctors are struggling with the business of medicine, and those that aren't truly understand that through association with other successful practitioners, they can take their success to the next level or something greater like prosperity. Prosperity in business is a function of mindset, marketing, and management. That is our mission at Top Practices. You can find out more about Top Practices, our marketing and management programs for doctors, our workshops, and annual summit at toppractices.com. Until next time, this is Rem Jackson. Smile when you wake up and then have a really great day. Your best day ever. Nothing is more important.